It's always good to get home. Are you comfortable? Good. May I get you something? Well, if you change your mind, let me know. Well, yes, if you wouldn't mind, will you open those curtains there behind you? I like to let the afternoon come into the room. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Oh, it's a lovely day, especially for February. We should have a lovely afternoon. Thank you for driving me home. Oh, the, the limousine would have been so lonely. I, I also appreciate your coming in for a visit. Oh, you must know what it's like to come home to an empty house. <laughs> How long has your husband been gone? Three years. Oh, my, that, that must feel an eternity. Poor Billy's only been gone three weeks, and it seems so long. My, three. He died on our 53rd wedding anniversary. Did you know that? Yes, it is. Quite a coincidence, our anniversary. Oh, and today's Valentine's Day, did you know that? Oh, you did. And I, I wasn't aware of it until the memorial service. The, the date was there on the brochure, February 14th, St. Valentine's Day. Who was he anyway, Valentine? Now, in the, never mind, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just wandering, still recovering, I guess. Do you ever get used to it? I mean, that he's gone. Now, I, I can't imagine that I ever will. Get over it, I mean. Today's service, oh, yes. Yes, that will help, but I doubt I'll ever make that adjustment. The serenity prayer. Oh, yes, that was Bill's favorite. Next to the prayer, St. Francis. Mm, he loved them both so much. They have, yes. They, they've been a great help to me these last few weeks. I snatch at them during the day and at night. But serenity, that eludes me. Oh, is there such pain? Pain that falls upon the heart, even in our sleep. No, that's not how it goes. Now, it was Aeschylus. Oh, yes, I remember. And even as we sleep, pain that can never forget falls drop by drop upon the heart. And in our own despair, against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. <gasps> the awful grace of God. He has gone. Oh, well. It's going to take time. When you get right down to it, that's all we get, isn't it? Time. Time to be born, time to die. How does that one go? Oh, yes, a season for all things. Poor Bill. His season was upon us all. Now he's gone to his quietness. Oh, how I miss him. I feel so alone. I, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I go into it so suddenly, just out of the blue. I get drawn back to him. He, he takes over my thoughts like a, a, an intruder. I, well... Yes, a, a welcome intruder, but he, he just takes over all of me with his memory. Memories, they're more like reflections, like, like reflections from a piece of glass. Or better yet, like the reflections from that ice-encrusted tree out there in the garden. Uh, no, it's just to the right of that old large oak. Do you see it? Every now and then, perhaps due to the slow melting of the ice, Sunlight pierces off that tree like a dazzling jewel, just for a few brief seconds, but so brilliantly. Now that's very much like my thoughts of Bill. Brief, piercing reflections of our life together, and then they're gone. 
Reflections, that's all they become. Mere reflections of lives lived, lives shared, lives ended. You know, you know, that, that time between birth and death. Oh, all those years of joy. Well, yes, mixed with tears, but they're, they're all collected in a, in a, a tumbling kaleidoscope of brilliant, piercing reflections. Many like the ones I've written in this little book here. This book, yes. And memories. Mm, some good, some bad. Memories, nevertheless. Never. Never, never, never. Like Shakespeare's King Lear, I'm, I'm left only with the never. Never to see him again, never touch him, never taste his lips on mine, never hear him again, never feel the warmth of his body, never again. And grief. Not only companion. Oh, please forgive me. I, it's just an old woman's nonsense. Bouts of self pity. That's not what you came in to hear. Now, what was it you said on the drive up? Oh, what was it like? What was it like in the beginning? Well, I can honestly say it was grand, <laughs> just grand. Yes, let's talk about that. That'll be a very pleasant way to spend our afternoon together. Oh, now, where to begin? <laughs> yes, I know. Keep it simple. Start at the beginning. Where else? The beginning for both of us. Well, it was 56 years ago fall of 1915 that Bill and I became engaged at the train station. <laughs> train station in East Dorset. Oh, East Dorset, Vermont. That's where I met Bill in Vermont. My family had summered there for years. Me? Oh, no. I'm a Brooklyn girl, born and raised there. We had a large family. And my father, he was a doctor. Every year he took us to southern Vermont. Oh, we all love the outdoors, oh, with comforts, of course. <laughs> oh, the summers in Vermont, they're among my happiest memories. <gasps> yes, I met Bill in Vermont. I know, he was a local, born and bred, a real, real Yankee. Oh, he was tall and rugged, handsome. He had the most extraordinary sense of humor. <laughs> Bill was a great talker. You know, I've heard it said that a woman falls in love first with the sound of a man's voice. <laughs> For me, it was the words that flowed on that voice. I fell in love first with Bill's essence, his being. Well, he was the most honest, <laughs> ambitious, and direct person I had ever met. Oh, his family life, unlike mine, was badly disrupted. It was just blown apart by divorce. You see, his father abandoned him and his mother. She sued for divorce. Bill was eight years old at the time. He was raised by his grandparents from then on, his mother's parents. Oh no, she left the area, moved to Boston. She studied medicine. In time, she became a doctor. Well, that divorce was very difficult for Bill. For the longest time, he had the feeling that his parents hadn't left each other. They'd left him. Well, his, his grandfather had a very strong influence on his life. And in time, Bill did develop self-esteem. Oh, but then fate dealt him another blow. He was only 17 when he suffered such a tragedy. It was the death of his first love. A young girl he'd met in boarding school. Oh, that put him into a deep depression for oh, over four years. He was inconsolable, he just couldn't be helped. 
And finally, in desperation, his grandfather sent him to Boston to his mother. And she took him to the best doctors available, and in time he did get through that. But depression, that was to haunt him for the rest of his life. Well, he finished high school in Boston, but all in all, Bill was to stay a Vermonter. <laughs> he had the strongest feeling about the importance of being a trustworthy New Englander, a Yankee like his father and grandfather. <laughs> oh, Bill was dedicated to being a man of his word, a man who could be trusted. Well, yes, I know, you coupled that dedication with the alcoholism later on in his life. Yes, you can see what a conflict there was in that life. Oh, Bill was always breaking his word when he was drinking, but that's the true nature of the beast. It makes liars of us all, myself included. Oh, sure me. Some of the worst lies I told were the ones I told myself. <laughs> well, we were to be married when he graduated from college, but his senior year, there was a hazing incident, and his entire class wasn't allowed to graduate. They all had to repeat the year. So the wedding was postponed, set back. But then all of a sudden, everything was set right. Our country went to war. That was the First World War. You see, Bill's college was military, so he was called up, made a second lieutenant. And that commission served as a college degree, so we got married. I went with him to his first post. It was up on the Cape. Mm. New second lieutenant and his new bride. Oh, it was very romantic. <laughs> it was 1917. Bill was 22. I, uh... I was a bit older. Well, five years to be exact. But that was never of much interest to either one of us. You see, Bill was such a self-assured young man, and I think that, more than anything else, compensated for the age difference. Bill wasn't a drinker when I first met him. He never touched the stuff. Bill's father drank, and he often talked about that having a lot to do with the divorce. He had his first drink in the army. As, as I recall, it was at a house party thrown by friends of my father's. <laughs> that we were there for the weekend. Well, the country was very patriotic. You see, people competed with one another to entertain our fighting men. <laughs> I'll never forget that particular house. <laughs> it was the first time Bill had ever seen a butler. <laughs> It was hilarious. He mistook him for the owner of the house. <laughs> oh, well, it was a grand party. We had a wonderful time. Bill got tipsy. Well, everybody got tipsy, myself included. Well, that's what people did. What we didn't realize was the immediate attraction that Bill would feel toward the effects of alcohol. Uh, a liberation from certain feelings, certain anxieties. Well, I'm not going to go into that. That was Bill's story. It was always much better told by him. Suffice it to say that that was the start of 17 years of sadness and ultimate tragedy. <laughs> yes, familiar to us all. But let's not dwell on those memories. I, I think it would be much better to concentrate on the triumph of that whole experience, the climb back from the brink of oblivion for both of us. Oh, my, that was a long time ago. It seems like yesterday. Bill took his last drink on December 11th, 1934. That's when he entered Towns Hospital for the last time. Last time as a patient, that is. And it was there that he had a spiritual experience that just totally removed from him his alcoholic obsession. And it was there that he decided to dedicate his life to helping others like himself. <laughs> and it was there that I was invited to make that journey with him. I can honestly say, at the time, I wasn't very enthusiastic. Oh, I'm not a very good storyteller. Have I mentioned Ebby, Ebby T? 
Oh, well, then I am sorry. Without Abby, there wouldn't even be any story. Abby and Bill were old friends from boarding school days. Abby knew Bill long before I did. Yeah, they were very close, <laughs> drinking buddies. It was Abby who got Bill to contact the Oxford group. He became Bill's sponsor. Oh, that was long before sponsorship was in use. Bill was on a terrible tear. He'd fallen off the wagon after two months of hard-won sobriety. Ah, uh, it was an awful binge. We weren't speaking. I was at the end of my rope. <laughs> well, yes, I'd been there before. Many times before. You see, on Bill's last visit to the hospital before this binge, his doctor, Dr. Silkworth, had told us both that Bill was doomed if he ever drank again. That's what kept him sober for those two months. And then, again, on a golf outing, he slipped, he got falling down drunk. And for the first time in his life, he became frightened, frightened of himself. After that experience, he wouldn't even go out of the house. I don't know where he found the money. Every single day, he had his bootlegger drop off enough to keep him drunk. And I kept my distance waiting. <laughs> yeah, I'd done that before. Waiting for the collapse. And that's when Ebby showed up. On the devil's day off. Oh, 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 thank God. Yes, indeed. Thank God. Some months before, Abby had been in the same shape Bill was in. He was arrested after an automobile accident, and at his hearing, some of his friends showed up. They convinced the magistrate to release Abby to their care. <laughs> they were groupers. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the Oxford group. The OGs, that's another name they went by. <laughs> they, we went by. Anyway, Abby was staying sober by following certain tenets of their certain ideas, as Ebbe put it, peculiar to them. <laughs> Actually, they were ideas that could be found for the most part in the good book, in the Bible. The Oxford group? Well, that was a fellowship of men and women who gathered together for spiritual solace. It was, uh, it was started early in this century by a Pennsylvania minister. His name was Frank Buckman. <laughs> Frank B. He preferred to call himself. Oh, Bill thought that was a wonderful idea. It showed just the right touch of humility. Initials instead of last names. No, it didn't have anything to do with anonymity. No, that was to come much later, and with good reason. Well, the Oxford group failed at first in this country, but it became very popular in England at Oxford University, and hence the name, the Oxford group. That's another thing we adopted for our use, the word group, their program. Well, it was really very simple. Acknowledge your dependence on God. Examine the circumstances of your life. Recognize your faults and share that with another person. Make restitution for the harms you've caused and seek further guidance from God through daily prayer and meditation. And finally, this was the purpose of Ebby's visit. Try to find a way to help others to find what you found for yourself. I know, at first it seems an impossible task, but it can be done with help. All that's needed is fellowship, a mutual sharing with another person like yourself, like unto like helping others, thereby helping ourselves. <laughs> well, following Abby's visit, Bill did go to a meeting, and I think it was the very next day that he entered the hospital for that last time, and it was then that he had the spiritual awakening I mentioned earlier, and it was then that he decided to join the OGs. Well, as his wife, of course, I joined too. Well, in order to show all those people that Bill had my support, I didn't need it. It was all for Bill. <laughs> what else? Always for Bill. In a sense, that was my identity. Then along came that shoe. 
<laughs> there I go again. I'm sorry. Let me tell you about the shoe. Well, I tagged along with Bill for about two years to those Oxford group meetings. More often than not, they were held way over in Manhattan at Sam Shoemaker's Calvary Mission. Many a night after work, tired or not, I would go with Bill to a meeting. Well, it was an obligation. I certainly didn't need those meetings. No, I was perfect. <laughs> it was all for Bill. Oh, well, at first, yes, it was exciting. But then Bill got better and I got bored. Tired and bored. I didn't participate in those meetings. I just sat there and watched. It all got rather stale for me. You see, uh, perfect people have little or nothing to recover from, or so I thought at the time. <laughs> then along came that shoe. One night, I got home from work a little behind schedule. I don't know, something or other had held me up and I was late. I was tired. The bill was waiting, waiting impatiently, as it turned out. <laughs> well, we had a quick supper and I went off to change taking my time, as some people do, and Bill's impatience grew and grew, and finally he yelled at me, hurry up, we're already late as it is. Well, that was the straw that broke this camel's back. I snapped, I threw my shoe at him, and I shouted, damn you, and damn your meetings. <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> do you know? I think that was the initial birth pang of the family groups. <laughs> well, in spirit, if not in reality. I wrote something about that, let me see. I'm sure it's here. Oh uh, yes, here it is. Here are my notes. This burst of anger surprised me even more than Bill. I had lost my temper with Bill often, especially when he drank. Well, it was expected. But why now, with things so well beyond my expectations? Now, later at the meeting, I spoke about it to a friend. I asked for guidance. I reached out to another person. <laughs> I became less than perfect. And she, she helped me to realize that Although I had been active in the group, and I had, I tried to help, I still had not placed myself totally in God's hands. I was trying to do it all by myself. I wasn't just perfect. I was a saint, a living saint. <laughs> oh dear, a saint without a sinner. <laughs> Where? When Bill's dependence on alcohol grew, I wasn't that concerned. It came with the territory. Well, his associates drank, some worse than Bill. Well, take Abby, for example. But I wasn't the least bit bothered. You see, I knew if things got out of hand, I could change Bill. I had the power. I would be his inspiration for change. But as it turned out over the years, Bill got worse. My uh, inspiring personality had no effect. I prayed for help, but I never submitted my will to God. I never gave up the power. But it was a great blow for me to realize he didn't need me as he had in the past. My fundamental purpose in being was canceled out with his sobriety. He did it all without me, and I resented it. Others, not me, had done it. Others, not me, not the saint, had done it. And you know, they didn't need my help. Oh, what a blow. Here, what made it worse was the fact that I hadn't found anything to take its place. Oh, sure, I attended the Oxford group meetings, always as Bill's quiet, supportive wife. I didn't need it. He did. Hence that shoe. I deeply resented the fact that God in others 
had taken away my definition of self, that of Bill's savior. Oh, I deeply resented Bill's new friends. The fact that they, not me, not St. Louis, had done the job. And most of them were just a nameless bunch of drunks. Well, <clears throat> slowly, a bit at a time, the important roles I played had been removed. You see, he no longer needed me as a mother, a nurse, breadwinner, decision maker, a enabler, and oftentimes with relish long-suffering wife. <laughs> well, some of the roles I played were doubly important to me. We were childless, so playing mother to Bill was a strong substitute. Being breadwinner, oh, that was a tremendous ego builder. Also, I liked being needed. And that was gone. All gone. My smug self-righteousness in believing that I was all that a wife could be all that Bill would ever need. That was all gone. I know now that my attitude was sinful. Well, yes, a sin. Well, it was impregnable. Nothing can pierce the heart of a self-righteous soul. No, it, it keeps us apart from the rest of humanity. Nothing can pierce that soul except the light and truth of God's grace. So after the shoe incident at the meeting that night and sharing it with another, I walked under that light. I had begun to work the program for myself and God. In the brief span of time it took that shoe to travel across the room, God set in motion my eventual release from sainthood, returned me to myself. And to God. Mm -hmm. <gasps> well, I have come to believe that whatever deeds we do from our own resources, no matter how well intentioned, will fall short. To do good, we need to first find God's plan and then, with His help, carry out to the very best of our ability that plan. You know, ever since then I have, I, I've tried to take a daily inventory and I've tried to be honest, well, here, analyzing my thoughts and feelings as objectively as possible. Hmm, it's too easy to fool ourselves. Rationalizing motives is hard to overcome. But it does come through God's unlimited love. One need only place oneself a day at a time under the light of that love. Oh, keeping in mind this simple truth, every saint has a past and every sinner a future. Oh, those early years, they were wonderfully frenetic. There was a frenzied activity on the part of all of us involved, drunks and their wives, to, to carry the message to a waiting world. Well, the message had to be carried, you see, our only means of contact with people who made inquiries was to make personal visits. Oh, yes, in time we did get some press coverage, but mostly our work was carried by word of mouth. And then, through contact with the Rockefeller Foundation, the idea of a book was born. <laughs> we, we managed to raise enough money to start our own publishing company. <laughs> Everybody pitched in, myself included, yes. Oh, and that book got written and a title was chosen, became the name of our fellowship. And finally, after such a long struggle, our word began to receive much wider distribution. Well, you see, now when the inquiries came in, all we had to do was send out a book. We didn't have to make all those personal contacts. Oh, yes, our, our society grew and it continues to grow all because of that book. Well, here. This book, oh, and it was the cause of a terrible Donnybrook between Bill and me. Our first real fight since his recovery, all had to do with ego, my ego, wrapping itself around another bout of self-righteousness here. All had to do with this chapter, Two Wives. 
You see, it had been my understanding right from the very first discussion of the book's outline that when we got to this part, of course I would write it. Who else? I was perfect for the job. It was a foregone conclusion. When Bill got to this, the task would be assigned to me. Hmm. Well, it never happened. Bill wrote that. When I finally went to him and asked if they weren't about ready to have me start writing, I was informed that it had already been done. Oh, I was furious. Bill didn't understand my reaction. You see, I'd never expressed any desire to write this chapter. I had just assumed that when they got to it, of course, the job would be given to me. <laughs> assume. Or what is it they say about that word, assume? The first three letters? Ass. <laughs> well, that's just what I'd gone done, made a total ass of myself. And to make matters worse, I wouldn't budge. Oh, that, that must have lasted a week. I was cool as a cucumber. My God, I was perfect for the job. Who else could do it better? <laughs> well, once again, when I was ready, the grace of God penetrated my heart. One day when I was taking an inventory, I, I realized I was the least qualified to write that chapter. <laughs> that was hard to take. But thank God I bowed to the truth. Now, what was it I wrote? Let me see. A little further on. Here we are. Many members were writing their stories on drinking and recovery. Most of them came from the Akron area, and a local newspaper man helped them so their stories were better written than most. At about the same time, I was growing in the realization that a loving, understanding wife could support her husband's newfound sobriety. You know, Bill and I were often puzzled and saddened by the failure of many families to maintain their happiness. Here, after the initial joy of recovery, that pink cloud period, the distortions in the families of recovering alcoholics began to appear. So we felt it was of extreme importance that the wives learn as much as possible about the disease of alcoholism to help them rearrange their thinking. You know, I think that brings us to the beginning of the family programs. Yes, here are the notes on that. At its outset, AA was a family affair. Well, whole families attended the meetings. Most of them were held in private homes. Many of us didn't even have any homes. We lived together. Well, times were tough, and we, I guess all of us, were getting a little desperate. The depression still gripped this country, you see. But out of that national despair, our program of hope kept us going and growing. Many of the wives were able to use the program for their own spiritual growth, their own peace. Many did not. You see, as yet, there was nothing to help them understand feelings and reactions to their spouse's successes, and more often than not, their failures. There was very little sharing of experiences. So out of that void, the family program grew. The seeds of al came alive as family members of the early AAs began to witness their own recovery, began to do something about it. Annie, Dr. Bob's wife, well, she'd been active in the Oxford group before he met Bill. Well, she'd long recognized her need for a spiritual program for herself. Well, just as I did after throwing that shoe. So, whenever we got together with other wives, we shared our need to follow the same program as our husbands and how the principles of the program, which later became our 12 steps, interacted in our lives. So, after um, six years, that was 1940, we began to organize our movement. It was at our AA clubhouse in New York. When the AA members, feeling the need to meet alone, gathered in the assembly room, the wives would get together in the studio up above. You know, at first we played cards. 
But in time, here, we began to share our experiences. Well, it was there I first told my story. Oh, it was there we discovered we all shared similar experiences. It was also there we found out we were not alone. In time, we wives were joined by our members, sisters, mothers, and daughters. Soon it would be brothers and fathers. And finally, oh, this is of utmost importance, we were joined by family members of people who were not as yet in AA. Oh, the, these were people without hope. Mm. It was wonderful. <laughs> well, <clears throat> here. For the next several years, Bill and I traveled around the country visiting AA groups. Well, when I asked, I told my story, our story. I shared the joy the program had brought into my life. Well, here's what I wrote. The family program grew and grew and grew. We were no longer coffee and cake groups. No, we met to develop our own spirituality. The 12 steps. We're becoming our spiritual anchor. Mm -hmm. In 1949, Ruth G., oh God bless her, <laughs> Ruth began the Family Forum magazine, and she distributed it to any known family group. The articles it contained became the focus of many discussions. Now, that was exciting. Well, during Bill's trip around the country, that was 1950, he was amazed to discover many family groups up and running. So on his return, he suggested we establish a service office in New York. Mm. Oh. To be honest, I, I must admit, I wasn't very interested. <coughs> oh, well, we had just moved into this, uh, this house. The first house we'd ever owned and all I wanted to do was work in the garden and make things I thought the house needed. <laughs> oh yes, we ex-saints can be very selfish. <laughs> very selfish indeed. So, here, it was a full year later, 1951, that action was taken. After the AA General Service Conference, I asked the wives of the, the attending delegates to meet with me and other AA wives here, here at Stepping Stones. As it turned out, all but two or three belonged to family groups. So it was then that I decided to open a service center, and I asked Anne and B to help me. Annie, Bob's wife, oh, she, she died about three years early. Oh, God bless and keep her beautiful soul. She, she was such a dear friend. Now, we worked right here, upstairs. Working from a list given to us by the AA General Service Office, we wrote to the then known 87 non-alcoholic individuals or family groups that had written to AA, asking for literature and a listing in the National Directory. AA didn't really think they should be listed as all their efforts were geared to helping the alcoholic, not the family. So, in our letter we stated the intended purpose of the family group to be threefold. One, to give understanding and cooperation to the AA at home. Two, to live with the 12 steps ourselves in order to grow spiritually along with our AA. And three, to welcome and give comfort to the families of new AAs. In the letter, we also asked if they approved our calling ourselves the AA Family Group and whether or not we should adopt the 12 steps without change. Well, the replies came in fast and furious. More than half of them asked to be unified. Ha, we were off. <laughs> AA was a tremendous assistance in the early days. Their efforts were tireless on our behalf. They gave us space at some of their larger meeting areas, and they, they guided us in developing structure and policy. They gave us money. Hmm. In time, when we outgrew that room upstairs,
they let us move into the AA clubhouse in New York City. That was over on 24th Street. So a year later, 1952, we had enough returned information from the questionnaire we'd set out to arrive at a name for ourselves. From group names such as the AA Auxiliary, Triple A, Non-Alcoholics Anonymous, AA Associates, we finally arrived at Al-Anon Family Groups. Al-Anon, of course, a derivative of Alcoholics Anonymous. But it took longer for us to decide on our principles. You see, some groups had already developed steps of their own. So in time, we decided for AA's 12 steps with one change. In the 12th step, we changed the word alcoholic for others. We carry the message to others, not to alcoholics. Oh, how can a person who's undergone a spiritual awakening not carry a message? You know, many, many an alcoholic has witnessed to the fact that a personality change in his spouse has prompted him into recovery. <laughs> now, how's that for a side benefit? <laughs> I'd like to read you something that I wrote a long time ago. It was part of a talk I gave at AA's 20th anniversary. Here it is. Oh, it's as true today as it was all those years ago. To be the truth forever. The Al-Anon family groups are a spontaneous response to a vital need. We follow the lead of you in AA. We admit that we too are powerless over alcohol. We try to take our hands off your problems. We acknowledge the integrity of your lives as well as of our own. We try to take our own inventories, to admit to God and another the exact nature of our wrongs. We make amends to those we've harmed. And we seek through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understand Him. And we try to carry this message to others. We are trying to the best of our ability to live by the principles that have done so much for you. Oh, that was so long ago. It does feel like yesterday. It was a Sunday afternoon, very, very much like today. Now they're all gone. Evie, Bob, Dr. Bob and his beloved Annie, and my Bill. My fine young man, they're all gone. You're right. They're not gone. The, the fire they lit, well, you could see it today in the eyes of those people. You could see it in their faces. No, it's still there. The hope is still there. The fire, what was that thought? What was it he used to say? He loved to say it. No, it was something he'd heard, something he'd read. Usually during our quiet time together, fire. Oh, I know, it was that French priest. Yes, I remember. Someday, someday after we have mastered the wind, the waves, the tides, and gravity, we will harness for God the energies of love. And then, for the second time in the history of the world, mankind will have discovered fire. Yes, that's what I saw today. The energies of love. And when you get right down to it, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Love. Mm. Bob said it best the last time he spoke. He said, when you simmer down our 12 steps, they resolve themselves into two words. Love and service. <laughs> yeah. Now there's the energy of our programs. Love and service. They will never be gone to us. And Bill and the others, oh, 
they too will endure in the language of our hearts and in our voices of experiences, our words of hope, and in that shared vision of internal peace and strength. Oh, and most of all, in those, those silent prayers that ask only for serenity, courage, and wisdom. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, my, look, we seem to have lost the afternoon. The time has flown. What, what time is it? Oh, my, it's after five. It's almost time for my nap. <laughs> oh, yes, naps. <laughs> Lately, I've uh, fallen into the habit of a short nap before supper. Started after Bill died. Goes with the age, I guess. Oh, Bill loved a nap. It's taken me a while to get into it, but it's become a very pleasant experience. Mm. Pleasant experience. Oh, no. It's become much more than that. It's become the best part of the day for me, the part that I long for the most. I, uh, <clears throat> I hope you don't think I'm silly, just a, an old woman's nonsense, but, well, at night I do. I, I still sleep on the same side of the bed where I've always slept ever since Bill and I were married, but lately, for these naps, I lie on his side, Bill's side of the bed. <laughs> I don't know why I do that, it's just the weight of it. Well, these naps are, are usually very brief, I don't know, less than an hour. But I awaken from them very slowly, as if in a dream. And that's when I do dream. And it's always the same dream. I'm in Bill's arm. He's alive. We're, we're young again. I can feel him, sense him, smell him. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. We have our whole lives in front of us. Lives of hope and joy. Oh, we're one. Together in a a silence that's so profound you can almost hear the smile of God. And then slowly, very slowly, coming out of that dream that's inside a dream, I realize he's gone, gone to his quietness. And yet he's not gone. Never gone. Always, he's, he's there in my dream. And it's good. It's not an old woman's nonsense after all. I have come to believe that some of God's greatest gifts are our memory. Reflections on times past. Memories of love. Oh, yes. Yeah. These are the best parts of the day for me. The times I treasure the most. When Bill and I are alone together, together in a dream. Oh, <laughs> that's enough. Oh, that's enough. I, I, I'm sure you'd like to get home before it gets too late. Thank you for asking me to share. It's always a help, as you know. Oh, and thank you for driving me to the memorial service. Wasn't that beautiful? Perhaps another day we can talk about that. Not today. Another day would be better. For now, let's just let it rest. I, I need 
to go to this other time. I want to go to my dream. Oh, please, stay as long as you like. And when you care to, would you just let yourself out? You know the way.